All right, welcome. We're gonna start the live in a little bit. Just gonna warm up for now. Professor Kai is gonna be coming in through that door in a few minutes. And for now, we're just gonna get ready and just get started. So if you guys have any questions as we are just kind of starting out now, let me know. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna be getting in a little bit. Just stretch the neck first, up and down. For the YouTube live tomorrow, I also have a warm-up video already posted. So if you want to check out the warm-up video for tomorrow, then that's also a good way to just use up time before we jump into things. Let's circle the shoulders now. Do something. Well, we are doing something. If you want to see something. <laughs> Which could be a very effective technique if your instructor is walking up behind you <laughs> when you do the backflip, then it turns into like, you know, an actual proactive technique. Right. <laughs> if folks have any questions, hit us up with the questions right away so then we can focus on what you, find, um, what you might want to learn today. So yeah, we just got a few people joining just now. Some people said hi. Um, um, how are you guys doing? Yeah, a lot of hellos, thumbs up. And today, if we turn around, we'll show you that we're doing a shout out to Seagull Taki Kamura today, who is 96, and we went to his 96th birthday gathering and instructors conference. And so, Sigum Taki and Sifu Andy, today is dedicated to you. All right, yeah, so we got a lot of people just jumped in already, so I think. Give us some questions yeah, so we know what you questions. guys want to learn. Yeah, don't be shy, just let us know what you think, what you want to do. Uh, otherwise, I guess in the spirit of Jun Fang Gung Fu, I guess we could start off with maybe some hand rolling or one hand chi sao, dan chi sao, or like that, or even a straight blast, or huge exercises that they do in the beginning of all the exercises. They also do like a kind of a kicking, snapping kick uh, movement in the beginning, just to wild the the kicks and punches. But um, if anything specific you guys wanted to go over, then now's the time. It is generally true that most people think they know things that they could actually use a lot more detail on. Right. Uh, especially on the first two things that Sifu Nate mentioned, the straight blast in particular, we found over time that most people think they know that, but then they don't really know it, know it. And if you don't know that, then actually the view exercise doesn't work because if you don't understand the core, then any iteration that expands from the core is going to be lacking. Yeah. One person was saying, what is some strategy you can do for high, uh, getting leg leg flexibility for kicking. Okay, so in terms of stretching, we did cover this before. I wasn't sure if it was on this particular live or on the YouTube live, but we did cover the difference between passive, active, dynamic types of stretching exercises and about functional range of motion. So one of the easiest ones that most people don't do that you probably should do is actually execute your kick and then isometrically hold it. So I'll give you an example of that. If I can back up a little bit here. If Nate gives me a front kick to the hip, let's say, right? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make it where he actually has the striking point of the ball of his foot, right? And then in terms of flexibility, he'll apply a little bit of extension and then now he's going to tense and squeeze his muscle as hard as he can for 30 seconds and as he does that he's going to try to breathe normally while he does that and then he's going to relax at the end of that 30 seconds bend his knee a little bit and then now i'm going to change the target okay i'm going to give him some calf support he extends again 
Now this is super helpful because it's, he's having to actively support his balance and he's in the same position he would be in a real kick. So it's not like a stretching machine where his whole rest of his body's relaxed. He's having to use all the muscle groups he would in the real kick. Now I'm gonna support him as he relaxes and I'm gonna change the target again. Again, keeping that striking surface and now he extends again. So in this way, he knows that in real life, he would still be able to maintain his posture and deliver power in this position, which it's hard to do without this support. In other words, a wall is super stable. Worst case, you don't have a partner, you can do that, but you wouldn't have the support. Okay, he bends his knee again. I'm gonna give him just a little bit more, okay? And then he goes again. And this is more difficult than it looks like but, you know, as you know, he's been training since he was a little boy, so he has a lot of experience. And we've done this drill together quite a bit. So, also, I'm bigger, so this kick would be higher if I was his size. I'd already be getting kicked in the face if I was his size. Okay, and then one more time. Now we're really going to kind of go for it here. He's kind of looping over my shoulder. And what you want to see is his head has still not moved back. So he's still able to communicate forward pressure and power that moves in a positive direction, right? It's easy to kick high if you lean back, but then you're not actually delivering any real power in your kick. So this is functional range of motion, proactive strength flexibility, because it's extending your range of motion, but it's having to do that while you use all the muscles in your body, all the tendons and ligaments to help support your kick and provide that support structure. Now, if he really wants to go for it, we'll go just one higher, okay? And I hope he did laundry and these socks are clean. <laughs> and then now he extends again. So again, if you see, his head is relatively level and his, his foot is now over his own head, right? So he, at this point, because it's now resting on my collarbone, this would be in my face if I wasn't trying to talk to you. So he's able to now kick someone in the head who's got quite a bit of size and height over him. And you know, what else could you ask for in a functional high kick, right? Okay, now to support him on the down, I don't just let it go. I go down to the previous level. He extends that strength again. And then after 30 seconds of that, he bends, he does it again. And then he bends and go back down to the hip. And then now maintaining his balance, I'm going to help him bring his knee to his chest. And then he lowers from there. Right? So the whole time, he's having to maintain that proactive posture in the movement. That's one of the best possible things you can do. So back when I was really trying to clean up all my techniques, particularly for film. Because in real life, what it looks like doesn't matter. Only worry, you only worry about whether it hurts the guy, right? right? But because in high school, I was trying to fine tune my techniques to be a big guy that could move like a smaller, leaner, more flexible dude, I needed my technique to be very clean. And that's what I did to help my technique be very clean. And even though I'm a big guy, my best friend in high school was even bigger than me, six foot four, uh, football quarterback. And so when he would bring his foot to the same level that I did for Nate, it really helped me. It meant that I could kick someone six foot four in the face without having to lean or move, which meant what? No telegraphing. Right. Because if every time you kick high, you have to lean, then most people will telegraph by leaning first in order to get their leg up and that's a huge tell. And if you're fans of Bruce Lee's work, you know that the kind of hard work that we're talking about is something that he actively did. Uh, another person who's outstanding at this in terms of kicking is someone I've also trained with, is Bill Superfoot Wallace, who made it where he could execute any kick with the same lead leg without you being able to tell which kick it was gonna be because he worked everything from that proactive set point. So 
that answers that question for you. That would be my number one way to develop flexibility for kicks is by actually doing the kick, but doing an isometric tension exercise at every point of range and motion while maintaining your strong posture and your bijong so that you're not telegraphing. So if you want to be doing the way of the intercepting foot along with the way of the intercepting fist, then you need to do that in a way that's non-telegraphing. Okay. Yeah, Any other really questions? Oh, that's great. And even on the receiving and feeling it, I definitely feel a lot looser in my hamstring now from doing that front kick. And I can tell the engagement is better. And also my lower leg was actually almost fatiguing in a way that I was having to stabilize like we were talking about earlier. So like it's a good workout for your, for your, your bottom leg as well, especially for the ankle joint and the bottom of the foot, the small muscles under the feet. Uh, but let's see if there's any other questions. I saw a few things. Um, if I don't want to do, if I would want to do myself flexibility for doing splits, how would I do it by myself? I don't have someone to help me. A little bit weird English, but I mean, yeah. Okay, so, so it depends on which split you're talking about. If you're talking about front to back splits, you could do something similar to what I just showed using a wall and crawling your foot up the wall. I would, however, use a wall that has some grip. So the gym that I built that you see behind me, I built this myself with my friends and my students. And on purpose, you see that it's wood on the inside instead of drywall. And there's three reasons why I did that. Reason number one is as a martial artist, I knew I was gonna hit the walls. And if you hit the wall and it's drywall, you go through the wall. So I wanted it to be tough. That's reason number one. Reason number two, is I wanted that grippable surface uh, so that exercises like the one I just showed you I could do and there are some other techniques I do for self-defense where I want a wall that I can feel and so there's reasons why I do that but if you have a, a grippy wall like fresh painted concrete your foot won't have enough grip you want something that your foot can actually get traction on if you're trying to do the splits that way my third reason is aesthetic. So as a kid, I don't know if you guys ever watched Karate Kid. I'm definitely a fan of the new series Cobra Kai. But yeah. as a kid, I always wanted a sensei like Mr. Miyagi. I wanted a guy that built his own dojo and then I could go to his house and be able to have that old school homemade environment that, you know, was creating a sacred space for training. I never found that, so I built it myself. And then in a weird sort of irony, I'm like, you know, Mr. Miyagi's giant grandson or something. But the, the idea in my mind was I wanted to create that environment, which, you know, then guys like Sifu Nate benefited from that because when he first started with me, I'd already built my first version. This is actually my second gym. I have two in my home. So I have one that has the wooden dummy and the heavy bags and all of that. And then this one has the mats so that this one's better for grappling and things like that. And the other room's better for striking. Someone was asking about middle split too because we did front split. Okay. Um, so if you want to do the Van Damme thing, so the, the way to get good at that, ideally you have a chain or a rope and you're going to hold on to that chain or rope and then you use your strength to like walk your feet out. And then what I just showed with Nate, I'm gonna squeeze my thighs together like a super thigh master. And I'm on purpose starting very high because it does not help you if you're, weak, if you're weak in this, right? You want strength all the way through as if in the James Bond movie, Goldeneye, one of the bad guys played by Famke Jensen actually kills people by squeezing her legs, right? So she has, in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, like an invincible guard, right? <laughs> so you want that kind of strength. So I'm gonna hold on to the chain of the rope, and then I squeeze my thighs, I do that 30 second burn, and then I lower myself a little bit more. And holding on to the chain of rope is also working core. And then I do that again, and then I go down, and I do that again, and you go all the way down like this, and you use the support of the chain or the rope to take some of your weight off your legs, 
But as you get stronger, then you don't need to hold on to anything. You can just walk your feet all the way out. And then your goal is to be able to walk your feet all the way back in. Then you know that you have true strength in the motion, in the full range of motion of your hips. The other thing too, is if you wanna work center splits, you actually have to make sure that you have that range of motion through your entire hip girdle. Because otherwise what'll happen is you got flexibility one way, but then everywhere else is tight. And then in a, in a kick, it's a fluid motion, right? It's a fluid motion, it's not a straight line. So you're gonna need to develop all those little muscles, piriformis, psoas, all the other little muscles besides the adductors um, <clears throat> that are gonna help you with the control and the delivery of functional power with your kicks. So with splits, doing it to show off, that's not so valuable. Doing it in such a way that you have strength throughout your whole range of motion, then you have a weapon that you've cultivated. We have some students that we know in Hawaii, Corey, who was this year yesterday, joined, as well as uh, Jitsu Panda from... Um, yeah, 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 from, yeah. from Togi School, yeah, Togi School. right on. Yeah. Aloha, welcome aboard. And uh, follow- Miss you guys. Yeah, I missed you too. Um, follow-up question was, is it okay to hold a pillar and do the middle split? Will that work? Yeah, sure. I just like the idea of a chain or a rope because in my imagination, I feel like it's much more shallow and badass because then I'm having to stabilize my body through the range of motion. If I'm using something super stable, like a pillar or a column or, what, or a tree, then I'm not so much having to use my whole body to stabilize the motion. Part of it is honestly to save time and energy. So if you saw what I showed with Sifu Nate, by doing that for five minutes, he's getting like an hour worth of stretching out of that because there's so many little details of synergy that make your the sum greater than the parts. My goal is always that one plus one is 11, not two, and two plus two is 22, not four. I always wanna multiply the value of the time. So if you have something unstable, like a rope or a chain, your body has to work much harder to stabilize itself through that range of motion. Uh, so that's why, but sure, you could even go right up on a wall and do what I'm saying. But if you have something like a rope or a chain, you get more out of it. All right, okay. What well, else, any other questions on was techniques? There nothing on, the, on us, uh, these sides, this flexibility thing. There were some comments about Karate Kid, because we're talking about yeah. that, and, um, and James Bond. Sure. And, um, yeah, those things that we're mentioning, but... Um, well, it's weird how that is. Now, if you're honest with yourself, I don't care how old you are, there was a point where you were eight to 12, and then you wondered, you know, about fictional characters potentially being heroes that you emulate. And the, part of the idea of that is it's like the rock climbing of life. In other words, if you have someone that you admire in some way, then it gives you something to work toward, right? Whether that's Bruce Lee or the Karate Kid. Well, the Karate Kid was more the idea of it. As martial artists, compared to the actors, right, we're probably both far more advanced than Ralph Macchio uh, <laughs> or the late Pat Morita. But the characters were what inspired me, right? In real life, you can't, I don't care who your coach is, even if it's you know the greatest coach in the world, you're not gonna join lessons with a guy in the beginning of a school year and be the best black belt in the whole valley in three months. It's, it's not really possible. Yeah. You can get way better, but um, I don't know about that one. Right. But it's a movie, right? Yeah. So the same thing with James Bond. Some of the things uh, in the movies are a stretch on what's really possible. If you're interested in James Bond, which I certainly was as a kid, I would say read the books because I got a lot out of the books and right in the very first book, Casino Royale, there's actually jujitsu in it, there's martial arts in it and James Bond loses a fight to one of the bad guys who is more skilled than he is at uh, probably Russian Sambo based on the character. But it's very interesting because a true hero isn't perfect. A true hero knows that 
he has things that he could be better at and on the right day at the right time he could prevail but under the wrong circumstances he could fail so if somebody's perfect a mary sue in um, movie comment land if someone's a mary sue that's not exciting it's the journey of forging yourself of making yourself better tomorrow than you were yesterday that's a value and that's in all facets flexibility strength fitness skill there are many different little squares right if you were going to try to fill in a grid of the attributes and, and skills and goals that you might have you can you can write those down and i totally recommend that whatever your goals are in jiku no in jujitsu and any martial art or in for Corey's sake uh, for firearms write them down and then little by little work toward fulfilling those goals because as a kid that was important to me i wanted to be able to have the skills like indiana jones and james bond and you know mr miyagi or what have you in a general sense which to me with indiana jones meant complete your education be a well-educated person he was a professor yeah. be very adventurous be willing to learn the language and culture in different places know how to do things that would make you valuable if you were on a desert island or you were on the uh, lifeboat in the titanic because um, i'm always making titanic jokes why because you're jack in the titanic and what's better to freezingly hold some girl's hand and go you know i really liked you you're gonna miss me until you're 90 and then you're gonna commit suicide <laughs> okay that's no value right meanwhile there's like dudes floating around that are already dead that have wool coats on and life jackets and there's all these floating boxes i'm like jack come on now indiana jones and james bond right. would get all that stuff Make a bigger raft because you know what's better than dying for the one you love? Living your whole life with the one you love would be a better plan. So, you know, when you're thinking about low, no limitation as limitation, mm -hmm. don't be limited. I mean, see the possible solutions, have the creativity and the vision and the faith that if you can see it, it's possible and work toward it. You'll definitely be better off than if you went, oh, well, I'm going to hold your hand and have you miss me not a good plan so uh, that's part of it right that's part of the journey so write down your goals work toward them little by little each day and don't give up yeah it definitely reminds me of uh, I used to read the Sherlock Holmes books and yes. his uh, his styles would later if I found was bar jutsu which is kind of like a mix of uh, like European bar fighting and like, um, like well, all it's these a different European bar fighting yeah. and Lacan which was the French Cane fighting cane related fighting, to right. Savat, yeah, related yeah. to Savat, right? Uh, yeah. Box de Francois. Right. Yeah, he had a cane with him all the time. Yeah. And he was fighting smarter, not harder, really. He was always thinking outside the box a little bit and being very creative with his environment, the things he's holding, or the things that surround him. And also a lot, creating a lot of distractions, almost like ninjutsu or stuff like that, yeah. where he wouldn't go head on into it. He would actually create a scenario that would give him the favor. So, yeah, no, I'm, I'm also a big fan of Sherlock Holmes, too. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, during this lockdown, my best friend from high school that I mentioned earlier, the, the big football player guy, he and I have been reading, rereading all of the Bond books and then talking about them because we read them together in high school. And then before that, we did Sherlock Holmes. So we did the original yeah. Sherlock Holmes stories. Uh, he lives all the way on the East Coast, and so uh, we keep our friendship going by having fun things like that uh, to share with each other. And it's also that kind of inspiration that you had growing up, right. it repeats itself, right? And it doesn't matter what it is. I was talking to another one of our students who was very inspired by Starship Troopers, by Heinlein's work. So it doesn't matter what it is that inspires you, reach toward it, right? Like to most of the world, Spider-Man's a fictional character, but to Nate, it, he's almost a real guy, right? Because he appears as Spider-Man. So there are hundreds of children in Hawaii that their only vision of Spider-Man in real life is this guy right here. So be willing when you discover a hero to work toward making yourself someone that would be that hero's friend. That's how I look at it. I don't try to be someone else because I can't be James Bond or Indiana Jones and, or anybody, right? You can never be someone else. 
you want to follow Bruce Lee's inspiration because even though he looks more like him than me, neither one of us could be Bruce Lee. I got the last name at least, but you know, Bruce Lee wouldn't want us to try to be Bruce Lee. The whole point of Jeet Kune Do was to find out how you can express yourself as a martial artist, you individually, and that the individual was important to fully dig deep inside and out to discover who that is. So instead of trying to be a fictional character or instead of trying to be someone else, I always sought to instead try to earn my way to be someone that if that person was real, that I could be friends with them, if that makes any sense, right? That I would have earned the right to, to be their buddy, to be someone they'd want to hang out with or go on an adventure with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And definitely these inspirations help you along that path and help you take pieces of what you like and what's part of you and relates to that other person, right? Because a lot of people have common interests. So those common interests you find in other people or, or, or in um, kind of like what we call, it, you know, like what was it? Like looking at someone as an I image to follow. In right. Sense, yeah, uh, can't get the words right now, but <laughs> like a role model, basically. That's it. Right. That's it. It's like a role model looking towards trying to do something similar to them. Of course, not being liked and totally, but definitely creating some inspiration and also following a certain path that they followed. And then eventually you're going to go on your own path and also find your best self, basically. And that's very true with Bruce Lee's first generation guys. What do I mean by that? They all learn from the same teacher, but look how different they are from each other, right? right? Look how different uh, Sigong Taki is from Sigong James Lee to Guru Daniel Santo to Sifu Richard Bastillo to Sifu Larry Hartzell, uh, Sifu Tim Tackett, um, Ted Wong, Jerry Poti. All these different first generation instructors are very different from each other because Bruce Lee's goal was not to create carbon copies of himself, but to help people become their best self. When I was like barely out of high school, I had a younger cousin that I protected from bullies. And then he said, oh, I want to train with you because I want to learn how to fight like you. And I'm like, Kyahi, I can't teach you to fight like me. Only train with me if your goal is to fight like yourself, but better because you never want to try to be someone else. You want to be you, but just the best version of yourself. And that's what you're striving for. Don't try to be someone else. It actually hurts them in a way, right? If his goal when he was learning was to try to be exactly like me, we both lose because we're not exactly the same. And at some point, I'm going to reveal that I'm a human being and that I have faults and then he'll be all disappointed See, a fictional character can always be perfect, right. but a real person is going to have bad days. A real person is going to occasionally not be physically their best or whatever. They could have an injury. They could have a, a failed relationship. They could lose their job. They're going to show a kink in their armor. And if you've idealized them as, as someone that's perfect, then at a certain point they'll fall and now they can no longer help you because you're disappointed in them. But if your goal is to work together toward becoming your best selves, then actually it becomes synergistic where a very good student will actually help the teacher become a better teacher. Because the better the student gets, the more the teacher has to be resourceful and creative in coming up with new ways to help the student grow. And then that pays forward to then that next generation of students. So if you're always looking to help other people in the best way you can, and to develop yourself sincerely and earnestly uh, to be truly a better human being, then in the long run, it becomes a win-win for everyone. One person was asking, can you learn martial arts from reading martial art books such as the Tao Te Kundo? There's a few other questions here too, so maybe just that one first. <clears throat> so you can learn one fourth of it, how's that? Mm -hmm. So you can learn a lot about martial arts philosophy from, from books. And as you might know, Bruce Lee was a voracious reader. I was a ridiculous reader growing up. I still always have at least three or four books next to me. And, uh, so every night when I go to sleep, I read. And anytime I have a break in work, I read instead of play with my phone. So I'm a big fan of reading. But for reading to really go the next level, it has to be connected to experience. So 
The intellectual facet doesn't have as much meaning without the physical experience and the emotional experience and the spiritual evolution. So yes, you can learn from a book, <clears throat> but since you mentioned, or since we mentioned Karate Kid earlier, uh -huh. you can't just learn from a book, right? Because that was Daniel Son's problem. He's in the living room of his apartment in Reseda with the book going, you know, ee, yeah, you know, whatever. Right. But then there's no other person for him to partner with. So then guess what? You have your own motion, but you have no timing. Uh -huh. So then you can't adjust to a live partner and you have no experience. So if Nate did that, or even if I did that, and I did that a, a four billion times, but I had no instructor correcting me, and maybe I made a mistake, now I've made that mistake a habit because I, yeah. there's been no correction to help make sure that you're really doing your best. So you can only go so far with a book, and I would sadly say the same about video because of correction. There's potential <clears throat> where if we present material to you, in a video format for you to emulate. Mm -hmm. And then you film yourself and show us that we can make corrections. Or if you do it live, like on a Zoom training or FaceTime training, then, oh yeah, no, move your left hand a little bit this way. Then you can fine tune it. So yes, it's possible to distance learn. Yeah. Universities during this difficult time are using distance learning, definitely possible. But if you only have one thing, like only a book, it's better than not having that, but only that you're missing out on the physical experience as well as the correction and guidance from a teacher, as well as the actual emotional growth of having that be uh, pressure tested by another human being. In other words, mm -hmm. in the air, Nate could be like, oh yeah, pox out, oh yeah, pox out, and never know that he has developed Zippo sensitivity because he's doing it in the air, right? So then when he actually, when we actually touch hands, right? If he's only done it in the air and then he tries it and then he's used to Zippo resistance, right? And now he's up to some big doodle, you know, he's, he's like, uh-oh, right? And now it's a completely different deal. And same token, right? He might end up with someone bigger and stronger. I might end up with someone who's quick and I might used to being able to lazily go, oh yeah, but then now I've got someone quick and now my lag time is too great. So I do this, I don't do this fast enough and now I'm looking at being on the receiving end of his box out. So you're not gonna have that experience without it being alive. And real training, honestly, requires contact. That's one of the things I actually like about the family of things around JKD and around jujitsu and around Kajukemo and Danzaru, martial arts that require contact. If I can get away with only doing forms and things in the mirror, I don't know if it works and I have no physical or emotional evolution. I only have, like mentally, I know this skill, I did these moves in the air, so now I'm a yellow belt with a stripe or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when you have the actual feeling with another human being, pressure testing everything, then you know, right? Um, how are you gonna cheese out by yourself, really? Even if you could, on a drill, use the, use the ring, right? Which we learned how to do when I was studying Wing Chun. Um, that's only because you already learned how to do it on a real person, right? We learned how to do this on a real person with sensitivity, and now when we go to the ring, it sort of makes sense, yeah. okay? Same thing with the mukjong, the wooden dummy. It's great as a supporting tool to train solo, but not without having a reference point for those skills with a real human being. So yes, definitely read, read all you can, but don't think that by itself that'll help you really evolve. Right, yes. Now let's, here's a good one. Uh, what, as, a as a complete beginner in my 30s, what is one basic drill I can do every day to begin my martial arts journey? So yeah, that's an interesting question. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff you can do. I think stances and like flexibility movement and even like just getting used to moving in space and, and time and being able to like control your body uh, would be a good one to do. Definitely working on either, if you're thinking of it from Wing Chun or, or Jeet Kune Do standpoint, learning either the center stance 
or even the Daizhang stance first. Learn how to control your body weight transfer 50-50 and also being able to step in different directions, then adding in your punches and kicks. But uh, a drill, what, what do you think about the drill? <coughs> well, actually, so my first advice to you, if you're coming from complete nothing, right? is learn how you stand and walk in such a way that you're aware of it. So you're relatively you know, young in the sense that it would be worse if you were asking the same question if you were 90. I'm a new beginner, but I'm 90. And I'm like, okay, what injuries and illnesses do we have to work around? So if you're relatively healthy, then the first thing I would say, if you know nothing else, is be conscious of your breathing and I have videos on my channel on how to develop your control of your breathing on box breathing. Uh, but ba the basic concept is if, this is Bruce Lee quote really, mm -hmm. if a man can't breathe, he can't fight. If he has no balance, he can't fight, right? So breathing, if you can't control your breath, you already are gonna be at a huge disadvantage on any martial arts journey you take. And then the next thing is posture. So if you're constantly stiff, then anytime if Nate pushes me half a centimeter, I go like a tree, right? But if I'm rooted and I'm relaxed, and then he pushes me, then it means nothing. I'm, I'm good, right? And that's important because it gives you time in a real situation. What do I mean by that? Well. If I was stiff and he shoved me, I'm already losing, right? But if I was relaxed and he shoved me, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, what's the matter? Then I haven't hurt him, but I'm also not angry and I'm not irritated because I was already ready for that because I had learned to be relaxed. So you can't move very well from stiffness. Yeah. So breathing, posture, and then movement, this is almost like a, kinesiology physical therapy lesson but uh, you want to move in such a way and if you remember Bruce Lee had a very unique walk but you want to move in such a way that your body is very functional very well controlled and able to move in any direction at will you want to have that feeling that your neutral point is a good base for anything that you might do so that's before you do anything else. Then now that you can do that as a drill, you could go from that into your bijong. So in other words, I'm walking, now I sense a potential threat, and then you do that, right? I'm walking backwards, we can feel like a particular threat, boom. I'm, I have something to my right side, we both turn, something's this way, and now I'm gonna be in a left lead, why? Because closest weapon, closest target, it doesn't make sense for me to have to spin all the way around. But if you know nothing else, breathing, posture, how you move in terms of walking, and then how you turn that natural setup of breathing, posture, and movement into functional fighting movement would be probably the first thing. And then, and that's because you got nothing, right? You're by yourself. And then from there, technique-wise, if you were in a class, you'd go into formality of courtesy and respect, mainly because it's good for you to learn how to leave your troubles at the door. And when you're in the training environment, you show respect to your teacher and respect to yourself and your training partners to clear your mind of whatever was going on before you started. And that also is a way, I was taught this as a kid, of saying sorry in advance. <laughs> so if, he and I are about to train, we do this. That means that I've just agreed that if somewhere in there, his thumb like scratches my cheek or whatever, I'm like, hey man, I knew I wasn't in ballet class. It's all good. If somewhere in there, you know, I, I, I ding him a, a little bit in a rib or something like that, and he ends up with, with a bruise, and he goes to the beach, and girls are like, how come you have a bruise? Instead of being like, oh, because I got nailed in training. Instead, he feels good and goes, because I trained. Because you know what? If you're really pushing yourself, no one gets through that unscathed. You're going to have aches and pains and bruises and, and whatever. So if you're coming from zero, 
start out with breathing, posture, functional movement. Then I would go with general whole body fitness, the mm -hmm. cardiovascular strength, body weight exercise, the, the flexibility exercises we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And then going into, before you go into combat movement, even if you're by yourself, do some form of noticing that moment. Well, whether it's just something simple like this, whether it's the more formal version, right? Whether it's a, a bow, but do something to say, this is my time to train. And then when you finish, do it again. That will help you develop discipline. And discipline is the way to freedom. You can't really have freedom if you can't control your use of your time. And so by having, developing that discipline, then you can discover what freedom really means. Right, so that's good, yeah. Uh, let's see, that was, I think there was another thing in here. There was something about ninchucks. Uh, someone was asking about ninchucks. Maybe we can cover that another time though. Okay. <laughs> someone wants to know how the dim mock works. <laughs> yeah, you know what? We really want to do that on Instagram Live so that if you kill somebody, they'll know who to contact when your court case comes up. That's absolutely what we want to do. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you want the good answer to the bad answer to that. Here's the good answer. There is some truth to it, uh, particularly in my Wing Chun and Tai Chi teachers were very good about demonstrating that. Also in Hawaiian Lua, my teacher in Lua, Alohe Dennis Eli, a big part of his curriculum is knowing vulnerable points of the body, which we use not just for hurting, but for healing. And there is truth to that. That's the good news, is that there's truth to it. Here's the bad news. You gotta be actually fairly skilled before those truths will work for you. Because you have to understand how to transfer power and energy in as few pounds per square inch as possible and effectively and accurately. So just looking at that in a book going, oh yeah, I've got to hit, you know, gallbladder 20 or whatever. That's not going to solve the problems for you if you don't have all the subsequent um, deeper layers of skill that you would have had to have had prior to doing that. So it's kind of like, Dimmock's kind of asking about what kind of curtains you want on your windows when you haven't poured your foundation yet for uh -huh. your house. But uh, it is a real thing as far as the real life aspects of it. I've, I definitely have used it, uh, not to kill people, but to definitely to make people uh, less functional, to make them easier to handle, I've used it that way. Um, at the same time, I've also seen it where it's been misused and it's kind of a hoax, you know, like if we're doing the Ryu Ken thing. Oh, yeah. And you're on the video <laughs> in Wisconsin or Puerto Rico or India, and Nate and I, because, you know, we're super chi masters. We just have to coordinate at the same time. And then when we go, Wah! then some dude in Sri Lanka just fell over because, you know, we got super chi power that goes through the internet. And even if you're not live and you watch this video in five years, you're going to get knocked out because we're just that badass, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, Clint Eastwood quote, right? Man's got to know his limitations. So yeah, you always want to reach for the stars, but you don't want to try to reach Mars in a 78 Mustang. You know, you kind of need a spaceship. So you need all the things you got to do <laughs> before you're going to get there. Um, but yeah, it's a very interesting subject. The best thing I love about Dimmock, honestly, is not the hurting people part. It's because I'm also a healer and I do a lot of work with massage therapy and bone setting and things like this. So the aspects where it can help actually make someone's life better. I just had to reset this guy's elbow last week. So if you can use that knowledge to make someone's life better, to me, that's more valuable than if I can potentially hurt someone I haven't even met yet. Right. It's almost two sides of the same coin. If you know how to destroy, you also know how to heal. So it's good to be that way, especially if um, in our own uh, culture, Hawaiian, we also have this kind of saying of like bone breaking, bone healing in our martial art. If you can break it, you should also know how to heal it, right? So almost like the symbol here, yin and yang, right? You have two sides of the same thing. So 
Yeah, those opposites. And a little of each one right. is in the other. That's yeah. the whole idea. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, there is another interesting one about stretching. What is one for opening up the hips in particular? And the other one was saying, how long does it take to be, for martial arts to be developed? And I can, <laughs> someone already answered it, saying it takes a lifetime. And that's true as well. Um, it never stops. We never stop learning, really. Um, depends on your goal. I mean, straight up, depends on your goal. So, <clears throat> in my own experience, people train for different reasons. And there's no wrong answer, right? So, am I training as a form of health and fitness because it's more fun than running? In which case, in a week, I'll gain benefit compared to before because I'll be healthier than I was a week ago. I'll be stronger and fitter than I was a week ago, right? Second is internal, could be self-esteem, self-confidence, uh, controlling anger and fear, uh, philosophy of having a clear path in life, of wanting to understand how we all interrelate with each other in a more positive way. So that internal driver, that definitely takes a lifetime. But again, you meet the right person that sees something in you that you don't see in yourself and believes in you, it can help you to unlock those doors to becoming your best self. And that can happen relatively in a few weeks, right? Third would be practical self-defense. Now for practical self-defense, you don't have to look good. It just has to work, <laughs> right? So practical transportation means you could have the worst car on the planet with no AC and a noisy muffler. But as long as it gets you to work and back, it's doing its job. It doesn't have to look good. So practical self-defense, you can functionally get pretty decent in, in a relatively short time. I would say realistically maybe three months, which isn't that long. So the idea is in three months with a good trainer, you could develop functional ability to defend yourself in a normal situation. Now a normal situation would be, would be not a duel but something that would happen to a regular person in real life. You know, you're at an ATM, someone tries to grab you, something like this. Um, a duel is a different story, right? That's like, you know, the movie fantasy. Because in real life, that doesn't really happen. It's kind of a myth, right? So even really well-trained MMA fighters, that's one paradigm. But you're meeting a particular opponent on a particular day in a controlled environment. It's not the same thing as you're walking to your car and now a social violence, there was a group of gang members with a video camera playing the knockout game. And they said, the third guy that comes out of the 7-Eleven, double leg him and knock him out, right? Now, they don't even know you. So you can't talk your way out of that. That's just instantaneous a social violence. So how are you gonna be able to respond to that? That's like the real jack-in-the-box moment. Bam, right? So you gotta be knowing what it is you're trying to do, right? So you're trying to be healthier, fitter, da-da-da. You're trying to be a better person, self-confidence, self-esteem, uh, clarity in your goals in life. Are you trying to not get your butt kicked in a real situation that you're not looking for? That's important, right? Next would be competitive. I don't care whether it's boxing, wrestling, or MMA, or Taekwondo, or whatever. But if there's rules, you got to train those rules in order to prevail in those rules. So that can take a while. The only good news is usually you're only competing against other people that are in the same boat. In other words, everyone has six months or less experience, and then you're going to only wrestle those guys in something like the Naga, you know, Jiu-Jitsu type of competition. Um, so there'd be that. And then lastly, artistic expression. So if you want to be able to reach excellence in how you move as a martial artist, right? Be able to do backflips and things and tricks like Nate can. If you want to be able to move in such a way that is aesthetically pushing the envelope for you, where you're pretty much like a, a fighting version of a gymnast or a high level dancer in terms of your control over your body right? That is an art, like being a tremendously skilled musician or a very uh, wonderfully talented painter or a very gifted author. There's elements, but then the elements are used in a way that's artistic. 
and to really pull the most out of yourself artistically as a martial artist is a whole other category, right? So those of you who know Nay know, you know, he's pretty good at that, but he'll be the first to admit that there are other aspects that he's always trying to get better, right? Mm -hmm. Another one of my students who you're probably not gonna see on a video because he's in the military and works in, in a kind of job that he can't really do videos like this. Um, he and Nate started with me around the same time and when it comes to the practical life and death stuff, he's actually my most talented student, right? When it comes to the artistic expression, which you know, of course, Bruce Lee's famous for. Nate's probably my most talented student, so compliment to you in front of all your fans here. But, you know, the thing is, Nate will be the first to admit that he admires John and wouldn't mind being a little better at something John's good at. And Nate is also willing to know that John, as his brother in our school, has also expressed to him a desire to improve in the aesthetic because both of them also competed. And Nate was helpful to John in fine tuning his expression to improve his performance in competition because uh, you know, that's kind of a middle ground, right? When you're pressure testing in a competitive environment, it's partly your expression and partly your functionality. You can't go full on crazy, but you also can't be totally artistic because the other person is trying to hurt you. So, and yet both of them, would say that the first two are equally important. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you want to be healthy and fit. You want to you want to be also internally growing spiritually and emotionally and intellectually to become a better human being. And you know, for me, at at different points in life, I've focused on a different one of those five. But the first two are always important. I think once I got past a certain point, then I was less worried about winning tournaments or looking cool. I was more wanting to focus on function. But the first two are a lifelong path for sure. There's no point where you can go, oh yeah, you know what, I'm good enough that I might as well be a fat, lazy slob and not be able to walk across the street because I can use my dim mock chi power to knock people out on the internet in Sri Lanka. Uh, there's not a point where you're gonna be there. And as far as becoming a better human being, well, none of us are Jesus Christ or, or Siddhartha, right? So, like, there's always a way that we can become better as a human being right. and in our path to grow toward becoming our best self. So, um, it really depends on your goal. Uh, but you do, I would say, identify your goal. Say, the most important thing to me is looking cool, fine. I support you and we will help you with ways to look cool. But the answer for you, if your goal is to look cool, is not the same thing as someone else who might say, oh, you know what, um, I've always had a weight problem and I went, just went on a special program where I lost 400 pounds, and so, no, well, that'd be a lot of weight, but <laughs> I just lost 400 pounds, and so now my body feels different, what can I do to functionally move? Or uh, if you're familiar with our work, I have students that are wheelchair bound. We have students that are blind. We have students with other disabilities. And they're already working against a deficit with the first one. So how can they maximize their health and fitness when they're already coming from a challenged point? And yet some of those students, quite honestly, are the ones you really want to see because you have no excuses if you look at a guy like that and how he trains. Then what can you say? The guy's been in a wheelchair since he was a little kid what can you say that gives you an excuse not to show up to practice if that guy is showing up to practice, right? right? So identify your goals clearly. If you know exactly what it is you want to get out of your martial arts training, you have a way better chance of getting there. And write them down. I mean, it's not an accident that Bruce Lee achieved what he did. He wrote down every single goal he ever had. And then he went to back up his word, right? Write it down, now it's there. You can't ignore it's not there. And then he went and sought after it. And truly impressive in that respect. I mean, see for Richard Bastillo, my teacher from the beginning, had that letter that Bruce wrote to himself on the wall of his gym. And you can't deny that Bruce achieved every single thing in that letter. That's staggering since most of us, you know, don't even have such lofty goals. But what goals we do have, write them down and hold yourself accountable to them. And then you just may achieve them. Right.
Exactly. Great, and that's almost all the time we have today, like about two more minutes. There is that opening hip question. If we need to save it for next time, we can, or do you want to do a little thing about opening, stretching out the hips a little bit before we finish off? If not, I think that's basically it. Uh, well, with only two minutes, my number one for that, how many of you check out Sumo? I might have to back up for you to see, but one of the one real good hip opener is just to start out like a sumo guy. So I'm pushing out my knees, then I sit low, and I push out my elbows against the knees, and you just keep sitting lower and lower, but it's active. You're not just like doing a butterfly stretch. You start from standing, go all the way down, go all the way up. Functional strength in the opening of the hip, and that way it actually can work for you with the supportive strength and functional power that you'll need for any of your motions. I was watching some more videos this morning. Can I do a some more thing? Okay, and just okay. for your entertainment, our student Kendall wants to show you some sumo. Uh, there was some interesting question, uh, stuff that was going on um, after doing that longer when we were talking about some good stuff that people had on goals. And um, the did my question was interesting because he said that his friend got hit and he's in a coma now, which I hope that he wakes up and I hope that he's safe. And uh, we pray for you and your friend. Um, but yeah, there's a few things here. Just want to acknowledge that we saw uh, a few stuff. So yeah, he also wanted to learn self-defense, be a good man and help people. That's good, good, good goal there. Self-defense and self-discipline, yeah, that's another good goal. And um, yeah, the rest was, that's it, yeah, awesome. And feel free to follow my Instagram as well. It's coach underscore Kai, K-A-I underscore Lee, L-I. So Coach Kai Lee. And then we also do live video on YouTube, YouTube. Yeah. and that's on the Ninja Nate channel. And then that'll sometimes tomorrow that'll be five. tomorrow, tomorrow at five, live at five. And at Hawaii time. Yep. And so we'll see you. Those of you who want a double, double dip, we'll see you tomorrow live at five. And then my channel there is Aloha Kai. I think I still have that thing I can show you. How's the glare? O L O H E K A I. That's my YouTube channel. Help me. I have no subscribers. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you guys could all make it. And I know uh, next time we'll see you same time around this on Wednesday. Uh, today was a little bit later time than usual. But we had, you know, some things going on here as the, I was actually at a work meeting. So we're starting to get going here for the gym and all that. So um, we're going to see how that goes, but hopefully we'll be back at the same time next week. But maybe, make sure you remember to catch us tomorrow at 5 o'clock Hawaii time. We'll be on YouTube. I'll put a reminder countdown on Instagram with a link to the channel after this so that you guys can catch that tomorrow. Remember to remind yourself to do to go there so thanks again i'll see you guys later have a good one